uh, welcome everybody back to Medical Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine. We're very excited to see everyone. Um, this is, we're kicking off the year um, in a, with global health, I think very appropriate. Um, while uh, this week is virtual, um, we will be transitioning to um, hybrid in-person Grand Rounds um, for the, almost all of the talks coming up. Um, so I look forward to seeing everybody in person uh, at Grand Rounds in the future. And today, a very special treat, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Dodd Siraj to introduce our, our first inaugural uh, guest speaker for the year. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Global Health Grand Rounds. I am delighted to introduce a colleague and a friend, Dr. Krutika Kupali, who is joining us virtually from WHO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Dr. Kupali is a medical officer for emerging zoonotic diseases in the Health Emergencies Program at the World Health Organization, where she currently supports activities for the monkeypox outbreak and COVID-19 uh, pandemic. She completed her internal medicine residency and in infectious diseases fellowship at Emory University, a postdoctoral fellowship in global public health at the University of California in San Diego, and the emerging leader in biosecurity fellowship at the John Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Dr. Kupali currently serves on the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene Training Committee, and is, she is the chair of the Infectious Disease Society of America Global Health uh, Committee. Dr. Kupali was previously awarded the NIH Fogarty International Clinical Research Fellowship and conducted researches in Southern India. She also has been serving as a medical director of a large Ebola treatment unit in Sierra Leone during the 2014 West African Ebola outbreak. Her clinical and research interests focus on health systems, strengthening in resource limited setting, outbreak preparedness and response, and policy. She has lived and worked in numerous countries, including Ethiopia, India, Sierra Leone, Uganda, and uh, Haiti. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Kupali served as a consultant for the San Francisco Department of Health, where she helped organize a field hospital. In addition to serving as an advisor to the US government, uh, she has provided expert testimony to the US Congress during the course of the pandemic including the U.S. House Select Subcommittee on her work on the guidelines to inform healthy in-person voting in advance to the 2020 U.S. election. Since joining WHO in 2021, Dr. Kupali has been part of the incident management team for COVID-19. Among many responsibilities, she has been the technical focal point for the post-COVID condition, what we call it long COVID steering committee. More recently, since the emergence of the multi-country monkeypox outbreak, she has been part of the monkeypox incident management team and is one of the clinical management focal points for that response. Dr. Kupali is recognized as a scientific expert in global health, biosecurity, and outbreak response. She has been a frequent contributor to numerous domestic and international media outlets, including the New York Times, NPR, Reuters, Washington Post, uh, Start News, the San Francisco Chronicle, Forbes, CBS News, and BBC News, among uh, many. And uh, without further ado, I will present you Dr. Kutika Kupali to give us this talk, and I hope to see her in person at some point in time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dodd. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and uh, Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today at your uh, first grand rounds of the academic year. So uh, I have a very large task today talking about uh, preventing the next pandemic and if we will be prepared. I think that is something very much on people's minds these days given where we are right now with the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, with the current monkey box outbreak. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so 
I wanted to give a little bit of a history of where we are with um, major epidemics and pandemics. And this is a schematic of where we have been over the past decade. Uh, we have seen an increase in the frequency of deadly infectious diseases. Um, in fact, since 2009, WHO has declared seven public health emergencies of international concern. Um, this is the loudest alarm that we can raise. And as many people may be aware, um, we actually just recently declared monkeypox um, a public health emergency of international concern only a few months ago. Um, so we currently have three public health emergencies of international concern. Uh, people forget polio is one, and that was declared in 2014. Uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic that was declared in 2019, and now monkeypox. So one thing we know with certainty is that this will not be the last public health emergency. And with the devastation that we have seen with COVID-19 that continues to be ongoing, um, we need to become ready for the next pandemic. And we need to think about how we are going to become ready. And um, one thing we know is that, uh, again, um, infectious diseases have repeatedly reshaped the course of civilization. And this can be traced back all the way to the sixth century um, with plague, um, where 25 to 50 million people died. And we've seen this with smallpox, we've seen this with cholera, we've seen this with influenza. Um, and again, now with. Um, uh, COVID-19. So these pandemics can reshape society um, and they can have substantial economic and costs and human suffering. Um, public health threats and infectious diseases uh, respect neither boundaries or barriers. And 70% um, of the world's population is underprepared to prevent, um, detect, and respond quickly and effectively to these um, infectious diseases. So we must do better. And in this era of increasingly mobile populations, it's possible for an infection to spread from one part of the world to another part of the world in 24 to 48 hours due to urbanization, human behaviors, and rapid transportation networks. So this is just another schematic of you know, what we've seen with emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases um, over the last um, 30 to 40 years. And we know human health, animal health and the state of ecosystems are, an are linked. Um, and the risk of the animal-human interface is increasing um, given the changes in climate, rapid urbanization, international travel and trade. So where are we right now with COVID-19? And these are the latest um, numbers that have been reported to WHO. So as you can see, um, just in the last week, um, there've been over 3.1 million cases reported. Um, uh, and over 11,000 new deaths. And I just want to caveat this with the um, fact that we need to interpret these numbers cautiously. We know numbers are being underreported due to changes in testing. Um, we know that um, countries are changing how they test COVID-19, and so we're seeing lower numbers overall. Um, the cumulative number of cases that have been reported to WHO have been over 605 million, and there have been over 6.4 million deaths reported. So again, when we have a pandemic, it's really important to think about the impact it has on all of society. And um, that's no different with COVID. So just a little bit about how COVID has affected society overall. So in regards to global health, 90% um, of healthcare systems globally have been disrupted. Um, and I think it's also to think about the other effects that pandemics have on society. So we know um, when it comes to the economic costs of pandemics, um, you know, with COVID, we've estimated that there've been over 16 trillion of estimated revenue losses to international sectors. And you can see from the schematic there on the side, um, when we compare it to other outbreaks over the past um, 10 to 20 years, it really is much greater compared to um, other infectious diseases. So, for um, comparison, compared to the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, um, it's multitudes greater um, compared to Ebola or SARS, multitudes greater. Um, so, and this is just what they're estimating right now. You know, if we get another variant of concern, um, the impact will be much greater. Um, when we think about educational losses, um, we know that about 1.6 billion students have been displaced out of school. Um, the impact that we'll have later down the line um, still has not been quantified. When we think about climate, there's been um, a 30% less investment in clean energy transition. And what that's doing, we're all seeing the effects on um, 
climate change throughout the world and what that might relate to in terms of how that affects um, emerging infectious diseases is also something we need to think about. And then also poverty. We know that over 135 million people um, will be pushed into poverty by 2030. And again, those are just estimates. We don't know what's going to happen with this pandemic and um, what curveballs will be thrown our way. So these numbers could change. So what is WHO doing right now um, to think about trying to end the public health emergency? Um, Dr. Tedros um, spoke earlier this week about um, the, you know, trying to end the acute phase of the public health emergency um, this year. And right now we're working on trying to optimize the national and international strategies and operational readiness. And this is really balanced by trying to reduce and control the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, and at an individual level, this is trying to protect individuals, um, especially those who are vulnerable um, from exposure um, and reduce the risk of future variants. So when we talk about those who are vulnerable, we're talking about those who are um, at high risk, such as um, the elderly, those with um, uh, various medical comorbidities um, and healthcare workers. Um, and also really um, making sure we have good surveillance going on so we understand uh, the emergence of future variants. And this is balanced by also trying to prevent, diagnose, and treat COVID-19. We know right now that we are not really understanding um, the true um, prevalence of COVID-19 out there. There's under testing, under reporting. Um, and so this makes us a little bit concerned. And we need to understand that and also make sure we get treatments out to people who need them globally um, so we can reduce disease morbidity, mortality, and long-term consequences of infection. Um, because you know, with COVID-19, we're also seeing um, very large numbers of people with post-COVID condition or long COVID, um, as if people know about that. And we're just now beginning to understand what that impact will have on the healthcare system um, long-term. Um, we do understand that every country faces different situations and different challenges, and that's really important for us to understand. Um, we understand that uh, the United States is going to be in a different place than uh, maybe a country such as Australia um, or China. And so it's really important for each country to um, uh, individualize their strategy. So understanding the current and previous strategies, understanding their current epidemiology, understanding the population demographics and risk factors for severity, um, and then also understanding population immunity from vaccination and or infection and making sure that we get people who need to be vaccinated, um, vaccinated. Also making sure people have access to life-saving tools, right? So not just vaccines, but also therapeutics, um, capacities um, to implement and um, across all communities and across all pillars, making sure that we have operational readiness and it, the agility to cross, um, adjust actions and surge as needed. Um, as we head into the fall months in um, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, what that might look like as we are concerned that there may be a surge and not just a surge of COVID, but potentially also um, other uh, concomitant respiratory viral infections. And also really working to engage the public to develop trust, societal engagement and um, uh, quell unrest. Um, we've seen that um, with COVID-19, there's really been um, a marked um, uh, problem with uh, public trust um, and societal engagement, um, unlike what we've seen with other uh, infectious diseases outbreaks. So as I spoke to earlier, we know COVID-19 will not be our last emergency. I think anyone who has um, worked in infectious diseases has seen a schematic like this um, in the past. And um, it's a map of the world where we see um, you know, new, uh, newly emerging, re-emerging um, infectious diseases. And the two arrows I want to bring people to look at is, you know, the one on the top here where um, we have COVID-19, but also the one on the bottom here, monkeypox, right? So this was one that we were keeping our eye on. And as anyone who's been paying attention the last um, few months knows, right, this um, has emerged and has um, uh, spread into a global outbreak. And um, so we really do need to keep our eye on um, all these viruses and um, pathogens, uh, because we know that um, over the last 50 years, there's been a fourfold increase in the number of emerging pathogens, but 75% of them are zoonotic in origin. And so this is um, something that is quite important to us here at WHO, particularly in the unit that I work in. And so what are we doing to prepare for the next disease X? So I think a lot of people 
um, maybe don't realize this or think about this, but SARS-CoV-2 was a disease X. And there are many other emerging and re-emerging um, zoonoses with pandemic potential, as we've seen before. So, you know, we think about respiratory pathogens, um, viral hemorrhagic fevers, arboviruses, orthopox viruses, and other zoonoses. And I think that a lot of times people don't realize that in some ways, we actually did get lucky with SARS-CoV-2 because there, this could have been a pathogen that could have been um, more transmissible or more virulent. And so we need to think about how we can build on the lessons from COVID-19 for um, a better future. We need to have a renewed focus on One Health. We need to develop a comprehensive risk assessment framework and a global risk monitoring system. We need to strengthen our costs cross-sectoral solutions. We need to enhance countries' capacities. Um, we are as strong as our weakest link. So we need to really build um, capacities across all countries across the world. Um, and we need to enhance preparedness and hotspots. So we have areas that we know that um, uh, particular types of viruses or pathogens can emerge, right? We know viral hemorrhagic fevers, things like Ebola and Marburg are more likely to emerge in parts of Africa. Um, we know certain arboviruses are gonna emerge in certain parts of the world. So we need to um, strengthen those capacities in certain areas to enhance preparedness, to improve early detection, alert, and responses. So what are the lessons that we've learned from COVID so we can prevent the next, next pandemic? And there are some key elements of preparedness. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of these today, but I think that I'm gonna hit on some of these key topics. Um, so we need to strengthen global research capacity for future pandemics. We need to enhance surveillance, testing capacity, and public health intelligence. We need equitable access to medical countermeasures. If we have one part of the world having access to all the vaccines and the therapeutics, but not another part of the world, we are not going to ever be able to get um, control over a pathogen. Um, as we've seen during this pandemic, trust is extremely important. And we need to work on developing trust by engaging communities at um, a grassroots level. We need to build and scale resilient healthcare systems. And we need to invest in long-term pandemic preparedness. We can't wait and be reactive. Um, until the next outbreak happens. Pandemic preparedness starts now with where we are. And all of this is essential for us to make sure that we're ready for when the next pathogen emerges. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about global clinical research capacity. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what WHO has done during this pandemic and what we can build upon and learn um, about so we can move forward. So what we have done about global clinical research capacity, um, so bringing evidence generation to the global clinical management guidelines in real time to save life. So one of the things that has been very important to us is really readily and quickly um, evaluating the evidence around therapeutics. So corticosteroids were prioritized early in 2020 and tested in multiple trials, including large platform trials, um, such as the recovery trials. Um, and this led to the first WHO living guideline um, in, on therapeutics in September 2020. To date, there's now been 12 versions of the living guidelines that include positive recommendations for corticosteroids, IL-6 receptor blockers, baricitinib, um, up until today, casirivimab and divimab and citrovimab. Uh, we just released a new guideline today, um, molunipravir, um, intermaltravir, ritonavir, and remtesivir. And we update these guidelines within eight to 10 weeks from data availability. So just a little bit about our clinical management guidelines. So like I said, there's 12 versions of our guidelines. Um, we actually just published an update to our therapeutics guidelines today, um, which have a stronger recommendation for baricitinib based on the data from the large uh, platform recovery trial, um, and also has a update for inpatient remdesivir based on the solidarity trial. We also now have a negative recommendation for citrovimab and casirivimab and divimab based on the data um, that it does not work on Omicron. We also just updated our um, uh, latest version of our clinical management guidelines for COVID-19 yesterday, which has a brand new chapter on the treatment and management um, for uh, post-COVID condition or long COVID um, uh, uh, yesterday. So again, we have a very robust process um, in the cycle of evidence to our living recommendations. Um, so we look at the coordination of the platform trials. We monitor the randomized control trial evidence. We meet with our trialists and we have data sharing with them. 
Um, we have a group that we work with to do the evidence synthesis with the perspective meta-analysis, the network meta-analysis team. Um, we early on um, start the um, meeting to have um, an expression of interest when it comes to therapeutics um, to start the regulatory process. We meet with our guideline development group to develop a recommendation. And then we do have um, access negotiation and allocation um, for therapeutics. And what does all this mean? So um, I just thought I would show people that, um, you know, again, this is a uh, schematic of um, our therapeutics um, under assessment right now. So um, we had the publication today, which um, had the recommendation for baricitinib, remdesivir, citrovimab. We're currently evaluating heparin and um, we'll have a recommendation for that uh, next month. And then um, last in July, uh, we had a recommendation that came out against fluvoxamine and colchicine. And once we have our guidelines, we uh, disseminate our work in many different ways. So we have our website, which has our guidelines. We have numerous um, webinars. So we've had webinars to um, discuss various aspects of COVID-19. Uh, we've, um, such as pregnancy and COVID-19, the management of critical care and COVID-19. Um, we have a toolkit for the management of severe acute respiratory infection. Um, we have various training platforms and collaborations with um, other societies, and we have also launched a um, study on molunipravir with our colleagues in pharmacovigilance to understand any potential adverse events of the therapeutic. Um, we also, in our clinical management guidelines, have a tool where you can um, uh, look at a comparison of the various antivirals. So if you're interested uh, looking at, let's say, molunipravir and Paxlovid and um, how one may um, be related to admission to the hospital, um, we have a tool in there. And so you can compare the different therapeutics and that's another um, uh, thing that we've um, developed in our therapeutics guidelines. So in addition to our therapeutics guidelines, um, we also have developed other um, aspects to understand clinical uh, for clinical research capacity. Um, we think it's important to understand the natural history and spectrum of disease um, for uh, COVID. So early on in the outbreak, we developed a case report forms for acute COVID, um, multi-system inflammatory disease, pregnancy, and um, post-COVID-19 condition. And this was a minimum common data set um, with core outcomes and um, a severity classification. And this was published very early on in the pandemic. Um, we also have large data registries available to pool individual patient level data. Um, for um, acute COVID, we have close to 600,000 individual patient records. And we also collaborate with ASARIC, which is um, a group out of Oxford. And they have over 500,000 entries that they will be sharing with us. Uh, we also have ongoing prospective data collection um, for severity in children with COVID-19, post-COVID condition, um, and maternal pregnancy and needle, neonatal outcomes from women and neonates infected with SARS-CoV-2. So one of the things that is also important, um, not just for COVID, but again, thinking ahead, um, is really understanding and investing in research priorities. So understanding the post-infectious syndromes from the burden of disease, symptoms, um, natural history recognition and pathophysiology, the clinical management, um, how therapeutics work in cigarette delivery, um, evaluating um, supportive care and clinical management interventions to improve outcomes, particularly in low middle income countries. Um, currently, we are developing and validating prognostic models to better describe high risk patients, um, establishing a, a reliable approach to developing and defining severity classification, um, and monitoring for therapeutic resistance and safety of. Um, newer therapeutics. Um, additionally, one of the things that we've learned from this outbreak is we really need to strengthen research capacity in low middle income countries. So working hard to build partnerships um, with platform trial sites. Um, so not all the studies are happening in high income countries. Um, and to that edge, we need to fund research. Um, we need to identify and engage local researchers and research networks. Um, we also need to expand our WHO collaborating centers to include clinical research and develop strategic partnerships um, so we can have um, a quick and agile evidence ecosystem. Because if we have all of our data coming from high-income countries, um, that is 
while helpful, it doesn't tell us a lot about um, different groups of people um, who have different risk factors. So another aspect of pandemic preparedness that is really important is understanding surveillance, testing, and public health intelligence. And um, there are a number of things that WHO has done during the pandemic um, to try and help um, improve this. And these are areas that need to be built upon. So about a year ago, WHO developed the Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence. And this is a, um, a center in Berlin that is building collaborative intelligence using technology, data, and analytics to understand risks about future outbreaks. Um, we also need to invest in novel diagnostics to improve strategies to predict, prevent, and detect um, pandemic diseases. We also need to understand the epidemiology trends and drivers of transmission and gaps in research. We also need to um, increase genomic sequencing to rapidly identify um, emerging viruses, um, develop diagnostic tests, and other tools for outbreak management. And finally, we also need to understand the animal-human interface of emerging um, infectious diseases. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these five topics. Um, so first off, understanding the drivers of disease impact and transmission. So um, you know, on two, one end of this, you have the drivers of high transmission, and it's really important to us to understand viral evolution that can um, result in more transmissible variants. Um, as we all know, um, as we've gone through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we have learned more and more about different variants and variants of concern. And so this can be due to lack of immunity, due to lack of access to vaccination, um, inconsistent or inadequate use of proven public, public health or social measures, um, insufficient capacity um, to use or adjust interventions um, on the basis of public health intelligence, um, and also um, misinformation or disinformation that we've seen a lot of. Um, and this is really important for us to understand because, again, right now we are flying a little bit blind in terms of understanding um, what will happen with the virus and virus evolution um, as we move forward into the uh, fall winter months. So a little bit more about virus evolution. So as everyone knows, Omicron is the dominant variant of concern, um, and but we are seeing a decline in the number of sequences submitted globally. Um, here on the right, you can actually see um, the oh sorry, um, you can see the number of sequences that have been um, submitted, and they are going down. Um, and we are worried that the the Omicron subvariants have the potential to cause waves of infections um, in different countries, depending on background immunity. Um, and we are currently looking at severity compared to BA.1 and BA.2. Um, we are seeing that BA.5 has had increased prevalence over the last few weeks, and this is something we are keeping a close eye on. Um, we are also worried about recombinants and reverse zoonoses, um, but the extent is unclear, again, because um, of uh, uh, challenges with uh, sequencing. So it is very important to us that um, we maintain and enhance global surveillance. And to that effect, um, you know, we have, se um, we have seen increases in data sharing and sequencing. So um, in March 2021, um, only 100 of, 105 of 194 member states had the capacity to sequence for SARS-CoV-2. And this is increased by 26% by January of this year. And in January of 2021, only 94 of 194 member states were actually able to publicly share sequences. And this has been increased by 43%. Um, by January of this year. So we are making strides and um, this is something that is important to us and not just again with COVID, but for all infectious diseases, we are um, actively working on this right now for monkeypox as well, um, because we want to understand what's happening. Um, and, um, and really to show the commitment to that, WHO um, released its global genomic surveillance strategy um, earlier this year, and it's a 10-year strategy um, to show a unifying framework to strengthen country, regional, and genomic uh, global surveillance. Um, this strategy really aims to improve genomic surveillance strategies and efforts against pandemic and epidemic um, infectious diseases, and uh, really aims to help um, improve uh, laboratory capacity around the world. So the three aims of this um, strategy are to link and embed pathogen monitoring within broader surveillance systems, um, identify opportunities to strengthen and establish capacities and systems, and then bring partners and stakeholders together um, to work on a common vision for enhancing um, genomic surveillance. 
Another area that is really important is also the surveillance at the animal-human interface. As I talked about earlier during um, this talk, um, you know, we we're very worried about the one health aspect of um, infectious diseases and understanding um, spillover events. And that's um, uh, when we talk about uh, infectious infections moving from animals uh, to humans. And we know that all zoonoses have a non-human reservoir or host. The dynamics of pathogens in these hosts um, uh, often determines the risk of outbreaks in uh, people. Um, we know the risk can vary with geography, seasons, or through multi-year cycles and depend on factors such as changes um, in the land use, weather, climate, and environment. And as I said earlier, we know that infectious diseases can move from one part of the world to another part of the world in anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, given how humans travel these days. So it is very important to understand surveillance in animal reservoirs. Um, these can act as early warning systems to better inform the risk of an outbreak, um, both in livestock and humans, and reduce the number of cases of human disease. So another aspect that is very important to um, pandemic preparedness as well is equitable access to medical countermeasures. This is something that we've talked about quite a bit um, during the pandemic. Um, at the early stages of the pandemic, it quickly became apparent that um, to end this global crisis, uh, we didn't just need COVID-19 vaccines, but we were also going to need to ensure that everybody around the world had access to them. Um, this triggered global leaders to call for a solution that would accelerate the development and manufacturing of vaccines, as well as diagnostics and treatments, and guarantee rapid and fair access to all of them. Um, the solution for this development was the, was the development of COVAX. Um, COVAX is coordinated by both um, Gavi, um, which is the Global Alliance Vaccine Initiative, CEPI, which is the uh, Coalition for Epidemic Pandemic Initiative, and WHO. And this was a platform to support research development and manufacturing for uh, COVID-19 vaccine candidates and to negotiate their pricing. So all participant countries um, have access to vaccines regardless of income levels. Um, and um, COVAX was deemed to be necessary because without it, there was a very real risk that a majority of people around the world would go unprotected against SARS-CoV-2. And this would allow the virus to continue to impact the world um, and go unabated. Uh, so to date, um, 12.6 billion vaccine doses have been administered globally. Um, and 12.3 billion vaccine doses were administered as of um, the 14th of June, 2022. Um, we've delivered or sorry, shipped 1.53 billion doses to 146 participant countries and 8.447 million doses are administered every day. However, despite this, um, strong global vaccine inequity persists. And as you can see here in this map, um, um, this is the number of persons vaccinated with at least one dose per 100 population. And um, there still remains a large amount of, of global vaccine inequity um, with many of the countries in the global South still um, not having been um, vaccinated. And this is something we are very concerned about. Um... So a little bit more on the um, COVAX numbers. So like I said, 12.6 billion doses have been administered globally. 76% of health workers have completed their primary vaccination um, dose. 77% of those are elderly. And 63% of people have completed primary vaccination. 18% um, of those are in um, low middle income countries. Um, 62 um, of the 194 WHO member states, 62 have vaccinated more than 70% of their population. Um, 131 have vaccinated more than 40% of their population. And 183 have vaccinated more than 10% of their population. Um, so although we are seeing um, some promises with vaccine, we still have to do better. And I think one of the challenges with the um, distribution of the COVID vaccines has been that we haven't done enough to get them to people in low middle income countries. So right now, the vaccine delivering challenges and things that we are thinking about is the window of opportunity to increase vaccination coverage is bound as countries address competing health priorities. Um, so we need to support acceleration campaigns in the next few months and use this as an opportunity to strengthen health systems. 
many of the countries with low vaccination coverage rates are dealing with humanitarian emergencies. Uh, so if we think about um, problems going on in the Horn of Africa, they have a huge um, crisis with malnutrition right now. Uh, so, you know, vaccine may not be the most important thing to them. So we're trying to focus on integration of COVID-19 vaccination within other humanitarian activities, and also really trying to focus on coverage of high-risk populations. So healthcare workers, the elderly, and people with comorbidities is still low. So how can we support countries in developing tailored approaches to reach high priority groups? And so when we talk about medical countermeasures, we also need to think about therapeutics. And as I said earlier, um, uh, WHO has um, reviewed a number of therapeutics and we have uh, positive recommendations for um, uh, normaltrevir, ritonavir, or Plaxalid, molunipravir, uh, corticosteroids, IL-6 receptor blockers, and uh, baricitinib and remdesivir. Um, however, um, getting these drugs to our member states has proven to be quite challenging. Um, so, uh, the ACT-A therapeutics pillar, um, ACT-A stands for the Access to COVID-19 um, Tools um, initiative is with WHO, UNICEF, UNIDAID, and Global Fund. Um, they, they designated a therapeutics allocation process that reflects public health goals and ensures fair and equitable access of available and scarce supplies. Um, beginning in 2021, um, they issued a call for expression of interest for therapeutics um, following the publication of our treatment guidelines. And so that includes our IL-6 receptor blockers, molunivir, and um, Paxlovid. And eligible countries have been invited to submit their expression of interest um, for these therapeutics. So this is a little bit about where we stand right now with COVID-19 therapeutics. So these are all the drugs that we have positive recommendations for. Um, and of all the drugs, the only one that is widely available um, is uh, the steroids, so dexamethasone. This is widely available with generic production, um, and this is um, available on our um, uh, emergency med or our um, medical list. Um, however, our other therapeutics, so the IL-6 receptor blockers, it's going through pre-qualification by WHO, and pre-qualification means that improves access to many um, low-middle income countries, and the treatment meets WHO standards for quality, safety, and efficacy. And this is very essential for many countries because if a medication is pre-qualified, um, this means that they can uh, purchase the medicine in bulk um, and they get it at a better price. So tocilizumab, like I said, has been pre-qualified and the EML is pending, um, but all the other drugs, so sarilumab, baricitinib, molunipravir, normaltrevir, ritonavir, and remdesivir are all um, going, the expression of interest has been launched and pre-qualification is underway. And so basically what that means is that many people in uh, resource limited countries don't have access to these therapeutics right now. Um, and that is um, a problem um, for these people who may be uh, suffering from not just um, mild COVID, but severe or critical disease is we can't get them the therapeutics that might be life-saving for them. Um, so when we think about the principles of equitable access for COVID-19 therapeutics, um, we need to select the therapeutics um, based on scientific evidence to address the public health need and um, have the relevant principles of equity to inform allocation strategies. Um, countries should be prioritized based on severity and vulnerability of countries and populations, and the stewardship of products and limited supply to promote rapid use. We need to have flexible, short, and long-term regulatory approaches to improve access and transparency to improve e efficiency and accountability. We also need to have collaboration across um, relevant stakeholders to accelerate the response. Um, so finally, I'm gonna talk about the importance of developing trust. So this is something that, again, I think we don't think a lot about during um, uh, pandemic preparedness. However, this is something that we saw very much eroded during this recent pandemic. Uh, so, uh, we have a whole department here at WHO focused on risk communication and community engagement. And uh, during the 2009 influenza pandemic, um, they developed a uh, framework uh, developed on outbreak communication and a framework for communication strategies during the pandemic response. And during the interpandemic period, so before the COVID-19 pandemic, um, they also 
uh, worked on community engagement and strengthening Ministry of Health capacities and a guideline for emergency risk communication. However, um, as many people are aware, during this pandemic, we really did see a um, an erosion of trust and a lot of misinformation and disinformation being spread. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is we've developed multiple different platforms. So we have our um, social digital listening that really listens to what's going on on social media to understand what types of uh, topics people are talking about. We have um, infodemic management and um, we work with our ministries of health to really try and um, uh, improve risk communication and community engagement. And we think that this is going to be very important moving forward um, so we can build and strengthen um, risk communication and engagement strategies as part of pandemic prevention and preparedness um, so we can um, be ready for other unknown pathogens that may arise. And so finally, I'm gonna talk about investing in long-term pandemic preparedness. So again, like I said, uh, pandemic preparedness starts now. Um, and so we need to be able to um, uh, predict, prevent, detect, and effectively respond to pandemics in a coordinated fashion. Uh, we can't have one country doing one thing and another country doing another. We know many countries are ill-equipped to prevent um, and respond to pandemics. And so we have to strengthen every country's capacities. Um, we need to develop resilience for future pandemics, and we need to have an all of society approach. Uh, we need to enhance international cooperation to improve alert systems, data sharing research at all levels, and we need to have equitable and fair distribution of medical and public health countermeasures. So that includes vaccines, medicines, diagnostics, PPE, oxygen, all these life-saving tools. Uh, we need to have recognition of a One Health approach that connects um, the health of humans, animals, and our planet. And we need to have accountability, transparency, and cooperation with the international system along with its rules and norms. And what this has done is brought about the idea of a pandemic treaty that is currently being discussed. Um, and it is felt that this may be the best thing that we can do to bring around political commitment of all member states. So how can we strengthen our global health architecture? So it's going to take a multifaceted approach of governance, systems, and financing. We are gonna need leadership, um, regulation, and accountability. We're gonna need capacity, coordination, and collaboration. And then we're also gonna need uh, funding. Um, and to that effect, um, just earlier this month, um, the um, WHO announced the financial, um, uh, intermediary fund, and this is going to be set up to try and help uh, pandemic prevention and response. And uh, this is being coordinated with WHO and the World Bank to try and set up a way to um, have a way to strengthen capacities in low middle income countries. So as I said, um, the approach to pandemic preparedness is now. And so we need to have collaborative surveillance that integrates surveillance systems, that expands genomic sequencing capacity, maintains and strengthens trends and transmission surveillance of cases, deaths, and hospital admissions. We need to have access to countermeasures, which um, uh, will monitor for, will, will, which will have integration of care pathways into broader health systems, coordinated planning and costs and strengthen monitoring and tracking against um, delivery targets. We need to have improved clinical care that will have early recognition, um, triage, safe patient flow, diagnostics to provide timely treatment and resuscitation. We also need to be able to address gaps in infection prevention and control and restore essential health services that have been disrupted due to COVID-19. And finally, we need to have community protection. So we need to be able to fully vaccinate the most vulnerable, expand social listening systems to facilitate improved immunization strategies and apply context specific public and social measures to reduce risk of pathogen spread. Um, but to do all this, we're gonna need coordination. And so this is gonna be on every one of us in society to be able to do this. Uh, so in closing, um, 
like I said, the time is now for us to prepare for pandemics. We need to build on research capacities, capabilities, and infrastructures, particularly in low middle income countries. We need to invest in maintaining and expanding strategic clinical research networks globally and promote large platform clinical trials. We need to establish priority clinical research tools, questions, and protocols that are part of outbreak readiness packages that will allow for rapid scale up of research during the next emergency. We need to invest in surveillance, novel diagnostics, genomic sequencing, and collaborative intelligence to rapidly detect novel pathogens. We also need to rebuild and strengthen trust along with risk communication and community engagement platforms. And we need to enhance collaborations and develop systems that allow for rapid development and equitable access to life-saving medical countermeasures. And with that, I am going to thank everybody for um, their help with this presentation. Uh, I work with a lot of people here at WHO that have supported this work. And we also have numerous experts that are involved with our clinical characterization and management working group and sub working groups. Um, and with that, I will close. And again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Great, well, thank you so much. I'm having some problem with my video, so uh, I'm on my computer now, not my phone, um, but I still can't show my video. Um, a great overview of a very timely topic. Um, there is a couple, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. So you mentioned the society effect that only 90% of healthcare systems were affected by COVID. Why isn't it 100%? Yeah, that's a great question. So it was actually 90% of global health systems. So you are probably right. It probably is 100% of global health systems that have been affected by COVID. I will say that, you know, those numbers are, um, were from a couple of months ago, you know, from a few months ago. And um, I think that, you know, there are some areas up until recently that um, didn't have cases of COVID, right? So I think um, you're probably right by now, it's 100% of all uh, global health systems that have been affected by COVID. Um, so that is a very good point. Time to update the slide. <laughs> um, another question, a very important question, you talked about the, the misinformation that's out there and that WHO is monitoring social media. So how is, does WHO have, um, a specific relationships with some of the social media platforms? Um, and is there a, uh, do you have a sy systematic way of deleting uh, misinformation or providing that information back to Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, or, or responding in some ways? Yeah, so we don't delete misinformation, right? Um, but we, we, we do work very closely with um, the various social media teams. That's a whole different group in WHO. Um, our, risk communications in our um, group. Um, we have a whole infodemic team here at WHO. They work with Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram and all the different major companies, right? To understand what's going on. And they do these um, social listening um, types of things where they, they look and analyze what's being talked about on social media uh, to understand, you know, the concerns people have, to understand the misinformation that's out there, to understand the disinformation that's out there. Um, so it, it is really important to us. And I think that's also to that effect why it's been um, very important to us to be out there, um, you know, having these press conferences weekly to address um, the information and the misinformation, disinformation head on, uh, because we wanna make sure that we are sticking to the science that we know that is important. Um, because there is, there has been such a concerted um, misinformation and disinformation um, problem during this pandemic. Yeah, um, and then along that same um, line of questioning, uh, my my opinion is that the scientific community, we don't do a very good job of communicating to public. Um, we do rely on facts as opposed to storytelling. Um, does WHO have a program? to train the scientific community in how to appropriately communicate messages to the public? Um, that is a great question. Um, I am not aware of one, uh, but I think that is a really wonderful idea. 
uh, I can ask our com communications experts if we have one, I'm not aware of one, but I, I do agree that as scientists, we are not trained in communications and communications has become increasingly important during this pandemic. Uh, you can, you know, we can see that with social media and all the different scientists that have been out there talking in the media and how important it is to uh, communicate uh, the scientific information in a way that the public can understand. Uh, so I can, I'm not aware of one, but that doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. So I can find out and definitely get back to people. Great. Um, and then in your, um, when you were talking about the dissemination um, uh, toolkit from WHO, what, do you do it in uh, multiple languages and how does that work? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we have six official languages um, and everything is translated into those languages. So uh, it is uh, French, Russian, uh, Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, and English are the uh, questions or the languages that we make sure everything is translated in. And all of our webinars, we always have translators in all those languages available. Uh, so we want to make sure all of our uh, products that we have out there are uh, available to everybody globally. That is an extremely important to us. And then if we have requests from one of our regional offices or member states for a language um, that it's not translated in, we work with them to get it translated in that language. Like one that often comes up is like Portuguese. That's not an official UN language, but we often get that request. So we'll work to do that. And then how do you work with um, the various professional societies um, around the world. Um, for example, I'm involved with the American Thoracic Society who've been very involved with COVID and it's, it's a, yeah. Do you have any um, insights into um, that interactions, those interactions? Yeah, so I think it depends. Each society is a little bit different. So um, we have a formal uh, relationship with the European Society for, I, critical critical care medicine and we have like a training module with them for COVID. So I think it just depends on the different societies and um, if they are, um, if they have a relationship with WHO and then um, it's really just about, we get approached by different societies for different things. And so depending on the society, we um, will work with them and see if there's a way that we can work together in a um, way that makes sense and that is helpful. Yeah, great. Okay. I, I cannot open my video also in uh, the same way. Great talk, uh, Kritika. <laughs> I have one question if you allow me, uh, Lynn. Yeah. Yeah, great. So this is kind of a very loaded question with the economic stress that these pandemics are causing, uh, thereby limiting the resources that could be allocated to mitigate future pandemics. How can we convince governments to spend more of that limited resource to strengthen public health and also outside of their country, you know, in low middle income country. That is a challenge, you know, a big problem, I think. And if you have any idea as to how to deal with this. Sure, I think that's a great question. And I think it's extremely important. I think, you know, I think all of us who work in medicine um, can understand that prevention is maybe not a very exciting thing for people, right? We see that all the time with patients who come in, right? Patients come in when they're very sick, they maybe not be so excited about prevention. Um, but in this situation, prevention is extremely important, right? If, if we increase capacities and we increase surveillance and we increase healthcare system readiness, then we can respond in a more agile and in quicker fashion. And that prevents, um, a outbreak from getting out of control. And so once an outbreak gets out of control, that is gonna cause exponentially more human resources, financial resources, right? And so I think it's how we frame it to all governments, our member states, right? And I think it's really important for them to understand that we're only as strong as our weakest member state, because if that outbreak occurs in that member state and that they are not ready, then that could be a disaster. Again, I think it's how you frame it and they need to understand again with um, the changes in climate environment, 
um, and how people are moving around, how quickly these diseases can move from one place to another. Um, it's not an easy thing for people to understand, and I don't think it's necessarily something people want to think about. But unfortunately, the reality is, is that they're going to be forced to think about it because of what we're seeing happening, right? We have um, not just COVID, we have monkeypox, we have cholera, we have polio, we have all these things happening with increased frequency. So unless we do something about it, it's going to become more of a problem. Great. Well, great. I want to thank you very much for a, a wonderful overview. Um, hopefully your topic will become obsolete. Uh, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> that would be wonderful. But we would be delighted to have you come visit Madison at some point in the future. I know you had spent some time in Milwaukee, um, so not too far. Um, but uh, I thank you again for a wonderful overview uh, and uh, a peek into what's happening behind the scenes at WHO um, and all the great work that is being done there. Um, so I uh, appreciate the wonderful talk. Thank you, Dodd, for, the, um, for um, bringing uh, Dr. Kupali into us. Uh, and I hope everybody has a wonderful week and the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.